everybody, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me today is Dr. Michael Hewitt, uh, board certified anesthesiologist with Monument Health. You're also the uh, current medical director of pain management at Monument Health, too, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, anesthesia is one of the specialties that you can do further training and do pain medicine. So, I do both. I do about 50% anesthesia, about 50% chronic pain medicine. So do you start with chronic pain and go into anesthesiologist? No, or in it's, anesthesi- it's the other way around. You okay. do anesthesia and then, and then uh, subspecialize sub specialize in chronic pain. Okay, and I suppose they kind of go hand in hand in a little bit then, don't they, sort of? Well, it's kind of weird that they are paired together because they don't really go hand in hand. Okay. You know, <laughs> anesthesia is pretty, a lot of acute care, meaning... People come in, they have surgery, and you basically are trying to keep them alive during the perioperative period. Um, pain medicine, you're, you're treating chronic conditions. So people with, say, chronic back pain, and that back pain, we treat it a lot like you know diabetes or high blood pressure. These things don't go away for these people, and so they have to live with this chronic problem. And so they are our patients for a long, long time, and we help them manage that pain so that they can have a more full life. So on the anesthesia side, there's a yeah. lot of acuity, and on the pain side, it's it's lot, a lot of relationship building and, and more of a chronic treatment okay. strategy. Uh, well, I want to start this 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 podcast off with a question that's been bugging me for years, Doctor. Do we really not know exactly how anesthesia works? Uh, that that <laughs> is partly true. You know, like <laughs> it's <if> always <laughs> fascinated me. It's partly that, true. They they know that they know that it works on some receptors, so they're. There is some idea of how it kind of works, but anesthesia truly did come about because back in the day, they would just try different, you know, drugs <laughs> right. and people would pass out and they'd kind of watch and observe. And so, um, you know, anesthesia, what we normally use is inhaled vapors and those inhaled vapors put somebody to sleep. And when we turn them off, the person wakes back up. We're not 100 percent sure how that works. But it's very interesting because it one is. of the things that still fascinates me to this day is when you put someone to sleep, if they're if they're telling a joke or something and say you put them to sleep, they might wake up and just pick up right where they left off, <laughs> even if they were asleep for four hours. So <laughs> so one thing we're pretty sure it does kind of pause the brain. Like right. It literally puts it on pause and then on pauses after they wake up. So yeah. it is, it's very, it's a very fascinating field. It totally. We don't is. totally know. Right. You know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. OK. I mean, I, I, I was going to feel really stupid if you're like, no, of course we know how it works. Everything is blah, blah, blah. But I, I mean, I, that's yeah, that's that's good to know. Um, so what led you to specialize in anesthesiology and pain management? Uh, do you have a do you have like a, a family background in this at all, doctor? No, no background. I mean, my father was a family practice doctor. So I, I did kind of our family does have kind of a background in medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just really liked being in the operating room. I liked kind of the acuity of anesthesia. I mean, you really, it's, it's when you're taking care of somebody under anesthesia, things happen very fast. You know, things can be going along great, and all of a sudden you run into a problem, and you literally have two or three minutes to fix that problem, or things could be disastrous. That's very different than any other specialty. You know, say if you're working in the clinic and somebody comes in, and they have a problem and you're not quite sure, you could do a Mayo Clinic consult, you could go ask your colleagues, you could look it up in the textbooks, but in anesthesia, you have to have all that knowledge at the tip of your tongue, otherwise it can be a disastrous situation. So long ago, I used to like cliff jumping, you know, and oh anesthesia is a lot like cliff jumping. <laughs> You're kind of hanging out on the cliffs most of the day, yeah. but every now and then you jump, and that's like an intense, you know, adrenaline th- thrill in a sense. Anesthesia is kind of similar to that in the sense that most of the day is going fine, but a few times a day something will happen in a split second where somebody's life is in the balance and you have to perform flawless to make sure that yeah. they make it out of the OR alive. And so that's the part of anesthesia that really drew me to, to do anesthesia. Um, I did pain medicine, just to be honest. It's because when the group recruited me here, they needed somebody to do pain medicine. At the time, they didn't have enough people doing pain medicine. So um, I kind of was, uh, they, they essentially said, you know, you have to do pain medicine also. Mm-hmm. So that's why I did pain medicine, um, which I've really grown to, to love pain medicine. I love my pain patients, and I love helping people who have such a horrible chronic condition kind yeah. of get their life back. 
So I wow. like so, so you you sound like an adrenaline junkie in a way, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Yeah, What's well, kind of funny is specialties right. age with you, you know. <laughs> yeah. When I picked that specialty, I was in my 20s. <laughs> now that I'm a middle-aged man, right. I like adrenaline stuff less and less. Like I, you won't find me cliff jumping now. Well, I almost, like just sitting on the beach. It's so. almost the pain management is what you get to relax with. Yes, then, that's when exactly you're doing right. This, right. So I find myself every year enjoying pain a little bit more and anesthesia <laughs> a little bit less. Never heard the doctor so. say that, but yes, that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we often hear uh, the people that say they have uh, kind of this might be an, kind of another myth uh, question asked your way um, that they have low or high pain tolerance. Is that a thing? Is there any truth to that concept? Well, so what's so difficult about pain is, is you know, the general population thinks of pain as emotional responses to some extent. You know, if I look at you and you look pretty normal, I might say I might make the accusation that you're not having any pain because, for you to be in pain, you know, you'd be grimacing or mm-hmm. there'd be other things that would kind of show me that you're in pain. The problem with pain is pain is so complex. It's not just about me sticking a pencil in your arm. It's partly how you perceive me sticking in a pencil in your arm. Um, and so what we call that in pain medicine is modulation of pain. And probably the best example of it is, is if we get, got in a car wreck and you had a really bad injury, you might initially not feel any pain. I mean, you you could Mm -hmm. have a very bad injury, but that's because the adrenaline in your body has modulated the pain in a way where you're not feeling it. Now, two or three hours later, your injury starts to come to light and you've calmed down a bit. Now it's really going to hurt quite a bit. And so how do you explain that, that it didn't hurt initially, but then it did hurt two or three hours later? And, And the reason is, is because it's insanely complex. So in the pain world, what we do is you kind of have to trust the patient. You know, the pain is what the patient says it is, when they say it is, where they say it is, and there's really nothing else there because I can't judge how it feels for you. I don't know how it feels for you as an individual. And it feels very different from one person to the next. And so a lot of people will say, well, I have a very high pain tolerance. It's hard to know what that means. You know, sometimes those people, you know, if I'm just being subjective, you know, you put an IV in them and they're jumping off the bed and they just said they had a high pain tolerance. (laughs) The next person that says I have a high pain tolerance, you know, you're, you're putting an IV in them and they seem like they don't mind at all. So, so that also is very subjective, you know, who does and who doesn't Mm -hmm. have a high pain tolerance. So it's hard to know what to make of that. There's no studies that actually show what that that's, that that could be a thing. Yeah, Yeah. I get it. What's the most pain you've ever experienced, doctor? The most pain. Well, <laughs> well, my thumb actually just. We we have a little tiny ranch our family has. Yeah. I was cutting down a tree two days ago, and there was a dead, huge branch that flew down and smoked my thumb. <laughs> Why is that the worst for me? Because it's the it's, it's what the just most happened. Recent. It's right. the most recent. Yeah. Well, that makes yeah, sense. As you distance yourself from events, the pain of those events does start to you you start to modify your memory slightly, yeah, of and they course. start to you know feel less. <laughs> now, what's interesting is women because they have childbirth to benchmark mm-hmm. pain against typically report scores lower if they've had children, um, wow. just because that's such a painful process. I have seen those. Uh, I don't know what they are that can mimic like uh, menstrual pain. There are things you can put on the body that they'll that they'll show they'll put on men to yeah. say how painful that is, and then they'll do it with a woman next to him, and the woman's like, "Yeah, this is this is the guy's crying in the corner," and you yeah. know she's like, "I it's really hasn't at the hurt part yet." Yeah. I guess. Oh yeah. That's that. But that is that is there a truth to that then? So with women and men and and the pain they experience, it well, in, in, are you talking about in terms of the difference that people f- yeah are feeling different? right right there is truth to. If somebody has had a very painful experience, they now know like what a 10 out of 10 is. So mm-hmm. there is some truth that if you've had a very painful experience, you might benchmark things lower, you know, because we are always asking people, well, tell me what your pain is. Right. Zero yes. to 10. 10's the worst pain ever. Zero is no pain. If your 10 is you have, a, have had a paper cut and that's the worst pain you've ever had, then that's your scale because each scale is very individual. Um, whereas if your pain is something that was very excruciating, you might say, well, I'm in a six out of 10 pain, but in your mind, you're thinking about the 10 being the thing that you felt. And so your six is very different than somebody else's six. Well, is that scale, is that hard to, to work with then? Or is that still one of the best ways you guys can kind of judge this? Uh, Because it seems like it'd be kind of difficult. In chronic pain medicine, we don't just use that scale because a lot of times patients, um, We'll, we might do a treatment or an intervention, mm-hmm. and they might come back and they say, well, I'm not quite sure that that helped. But then their husband or their wife or their mother or their daughter 
might say, well, wait a second, you, you never used to, you know, walk around the block, but now you're doing that all the time. And you seem like you're really enjoying your life a lot more. And then the patient will start to say, oh yeah, actually that is true. So maybe it did help. So sometimes our perception of what our pain score is, isn't the full story. So in the pain clinic, we look at a lot of different things, more than just the pain score, but what is your function? You know, how are, are you doing your activities of daily living? Are you getting out and enjoying life? So we kind of look at different questionnaires to try to gauge, well, where are we in this pain journey and how, how effective are our treatments? So does this pain management cover everything from, from, I mean, in some instances, maybe just a conversation with these people too that can help, to therapy, to, to medication? I mean, do you, is it, does that run that whole gamut in yeah, pain management? Yeah, so, so in chronic pain management, you know, the, the real challenge is, um, is that we don't have one thing that's going to fix someone's problem. Mm-hmm. And that, that even to me, is surprising. You know, it's 2024. Yeah. We do things that are amazing technologically. There's just our advancements in medicine are just amazing. But in the pain world, we haven't had huge advancements, really. Um, you know, if you look at different medications that have, like, one medication we use for pain sometimes is called Cymbalta, and mm-hmm. it has an FDA indication for musculoskeletal pain. In order to get that FDA, indi- FDA indication, there has to be really good studies behind it really per- being effective as a medication. Well, if you dig into those studies, it decreased someone's pain score by one. Well, so on the in the medicine world, you'd say, well, that's very effective. That's a great study. But as a human, if you came in and your pain was always 7 out of 10, and I give you a medicine and now it's 6 out of 10, you would say that's a horrible result. All right. So what does where does that leave us? It leaves us with doing what we call like a multimodal approach. So we use lots of different modalities to try to decrease the pain score one here and one there and one there. And we do that through using physical therapy. We really believe in rehabilitative therapy and your body's own ability to kind of regenerate itself and heal itself. We, so we, we have a very robust physical therapy program up at, up at Monument mm-hmm. Health. Um, We use cognitive behavioral therapy, and some people say, wait, wait, this is not just in my head. It's like, no, no, that's not what we're saying. But there are certain ways that you can train your mind to kind of cope with certain things that happen in your life, one of which could be pain. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the best example maybe is watching like a monk walk across hot coals. It's like, well, how's that person doing that? It's because of how they've trained their mind to be very mindful. So we have this, we have a therapist, JC, she's fantastic. She works with cognitive behavioral therapy with patients. So rehabilitative cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, We use medication therapy. You know, opioid types of medications are predominantly just used for cancer pain now. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole host of different classes of medications that are not addictive, that are very effective, that we can use to help patients. Um, We use interventional techniques. So we do steroid injections, you know, in the back. We can burn nerves off. We can put spinal cord stimulators in to modulate the way that you're sending up pain signaling to the brain. So there's all kinds of things we can do just with a needle that are very easy procedures for us to do. We do them under x-ray guidance. They, most of them take less than five minutes, and we can substantially help people's pain from that perspective. And occasionally, we'll send someone off to surgery. You know, if we've tried all these conservative yeah. measures and mm-hmm. they're still not working and the person's still very debilitated by the pain, then we might send them for surgery if they have something that seems like surgery could fix it. What is 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 back pain the most common type of this kind of pain? Yeah, in, back pain in, is for sure back pain is the number one reason that we would see somebody for chronic mm-hmm. pain. You know, if you're just a normal human out there in the world, the chances of you getting back pain is going to be the most common chronic pain condition that you get. Um, and in South Dakota, you know, we, we see a lot of that. And yeah. Part of it, I think, is because we have a really hardworking yeah, population. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a typical patient for us might be a guy who is 80, 85 years old. He still chops a quart of wood every <laughs> month. And he's worked on the farm his whole life. And he still wants to. You know, and he's coming in because his back is really holding up, you know, his ability to function like right. he would like to. So, so it's not, you know, I think a lot of times chronic pain patients kind of get a certain they get discriminated against to some extent but at the end of the day you know we're all just people and we're all just out there living our lives however we want to live them and a chronic pain condition can really set somebody back back quite a bit yeah and it's so horrible really because if you have high blood pressure the only time you hear about that is when you go to the doctor he's Mm -hmm. like you got to get your blood pressure down you have chronic pain you it wakes you up at night you know it the minute you wake up in the morning. It, it affects your relationships. It affects every single part of your life because it's something you feel every single day, every single minute, 
every single hour. Right. So <laughs> it's a pretty horrible disease process to have. So it's a, it's a very gratifying specialty to be in because we can really help those people quite a bit. And it's, it's surprising how many people don't even realize we exist as specialists. You know, we'll have, we'll, we'll take somebody who has been dealing with chronic pain for 20 years and we'll get them to a spot where they're doing amazingly well and they'll think, why did right. I go 18 years with this pain? No one ever told me that you guys even existed. So. <laughs> that's well, then that's kind of the whole reason why you're here, too, is to kind of spread that message a little bit. Um, ha- have there been things that have that have in your time in doing pain management, innovative things that have come about that, that kind of you're like, oh, wow, this is really going to be a big deal. This is going to help. Yeah. Yeah, there has been, you know. There's been a lot of work with the different technologies we use. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll burn certain nerves off to help with back pain. Um, we are kind of limited to just focusing on the joints of the of the in the back of the back. But there's a new procedure now that we can help with people who have arthritis in their discs. Um, one of my partners, Dr. Buck, does that procedure. It's called oh, Intercept. Sure. Um, and so there, a lot of the technologies have gotten substantially better to try to really help people with pain. And so that that part's been very innovative. Well, and I suppose they only will continue to get better as fast as, you know, the technology changes. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you 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 wish would be there, that that there's a, there's a, a part of pain management that, that that's common to you that you see quite a bit and you're like, God, we just, we can't get it all the way. Is there anything like that that you would like, oh, if we just had this one thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I have thought of that. And it's only just one thing. And I don't think it's a big request, really. But if on Amazon Prime, we could order someone a new back <laughs> yeah. and have it here in two days, that That's would make a, a huge... Wow, well, you shot for the moon there, yeah. for sure, then. Uh... Yeah. So, so I don't know how, how influential you are with right. Jeff Bezos. But Not if you could uh... get that, that would be fantastic. All right, let me send an email. Um... Uh, no, one, to, on a more serious note, you know, there is this idea that's being explored right now with regenerative medicine yes, and using like stem cells. So mm-hmm. what that is, is essentially when your body, you know, our body, all of our cells start out as the same cell, which is kind of surprising. And they get signaled wherever they're at to become an eyeball cell or a skin cell or a knee joint cell. And so the idea is, is if you take some of these stem cells and you inject them in a spot that's, that's deteriorated or arthritic, maybe then the body will start to signal these cells to regrow. So just like a, a baby does yeah. constantly, an older person potentially could. So instead of getting a knee replacement, maybe you could get an injection, and then those cells would start to regrow the cartilage in your knee, so then you have an 18-year-old's knee again. There's some evidence behind that working somewhat, but there's a lot of work that still has to be done to try to to try to make that better. So okay. I'm very hopeful for that, not just for myself, yeah. but also for my patients. <laughs> of course. <laughs> because it's a cool idea, you know. It and is. that's partly how young people repair themselves. You know, as we get older, we have less and less of these stem cells floating around our mm-hmm. body. You know, young people, they heal faster, their injuries heal faster, and that's part of the reason. So hopefully we can, as the research advances in that field, hopefully in the future we can just, instead of do surgery on people, do injections of of, you know, stem cells, and that's called regenerative medicine. So that part is a really cool field of pain medicine. Um, you you were, uh, you mentioned about people that didn't really know that this kind of procedures existed, these pain management, right? Um, how do you handle patients that are, once they get there and realize you're there, that, that get kind of anxious about anesthesia or pain medicine? You know, what's, what's the process, especially if somebody's about to go under? Uh, first time anybody's ever had a surgery. I mean, I remember the first time I was ever put under anesthesia. It it can be pretty nerve wracking in some instances. How do you handle that when they come into the room with you? Yeah, I think so. Moving over to the anesthesia side, yeah. you know, um, a lot of people will joke about anesthesiologists like, oh, anesthesiologists never have to talk to patients. You know, your <laughs> patients are always asleep. But if but if you actually think about who needs to be the best person with the patient, it's probably an anesthesiologist because somebody's coming in for a surgery. We don't normally have surgery in our lives. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be a huge event for them in healthcare. It's not just going in for an appointment. They're coming in for a surgery and often a major surgery. And they've never met me before. They right. have no idea who I am. And, and a lot of our patients are actually more scared of the anesthesia than they are of the surgery. So our five or 10 minute encounter, they're going to have to trust me that I'm going to take the best care of them. And so that's wild, actually, because they've never (laughs) met me before. We don't have a Mm patient-doctor relationship. I'm meeting them for the first time. They didn't pick me. I got assigned to their room. You know, so I think as an anesthesiologist, 
you have to be incredibly caring. You know, you have to be, you have to really listen to the patient. You have to let the patient, you know, tell you everything that they think is important. You have to make sure you're asking all the right questions of them um, and just really reassure them that you're going to be there and take really good care of them during the procedure. So I think some of the most compassionate, easygoing, loving physicians out there are actually anesthesiologists. And I think most people would think that that's not true because like, oh, your patient's always asleep. Right. But, well, but it's the front side and the back side right, there, exactly. is where it really matters to a patient. And I think that's where, you know, all of my colleagues do a fantastic job of yeah. that. I'm um, just really caring for patients. Well, that was a good so. shout out to all the, all the rest of the anesthesiologists. Yeah. Nice job yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. Are there any, uh, um, are there any misconceptions about like pain management or anesthesiology that you wish people knew um, you know, because like, like we talked about when we started this, th the process works. You mostly know how it works, but I'm sure people come in with a lot of, I mean, a lot of questions, right? So did, are there some that, that you would just like to put to rest for some of these people? Well, you know, in the pain world, I think pain patients, there's so much discussion around like fentanyl and opioids mm. and drug seekers and addiction that I wish that didn't exist because yeah. most of our pain patients are legitimately seeking relief of pain. They're, they're not seeking, they're not drug seekers. But I think if you, if you're not a medical person and you're coming in and you're just saying, my back is really hurting, you know, it's really hurting me and it's affecting everything I do. A lot of times people perceive that as, oh, you just want an opioid. And that, that's not the, tr that's not the case. The right. person is not a medical person. They want they don't want to have the pain, you know, and they're, they're not sure how to get to that point. And so, um, you know, I think just as a society, we shouldn't, we shouldn't jump to that first, that that's what people are wanting. Because I think as a pain specialist, that's not what I see. Most people, that is not what they actually want. You know, when you present all these other ways to get rid of their pain, most people, even if they did come in asking for an opioid, are like, I didn't even know there was other medicines mm -hmm. that work. And I, I didn't realize there were shots. You know, I just don't want the pain. They're not looking for a specific drug, and they're not right. a drug seeker. And so I think they kind of get a bad rap for that. Okay. Um, on the anesthesia side, you know, the difficulty sometimes is, you know, our job is to keep someone safe during the perioperative mm -hmm. period. You know, we want and we, we want to have their complicate their risk of complications be absolutely the least it can possibly be. You know, an anesthesiologist spend essentially twelve years in school to, to be really? able to know. Wow. That. Yeah. So okay. you're you're in school for twelve years. So there are no anesthesiologists that are under thirty years old. So <laughs> the youngest anesthesiologist yeah. you'll ever meet is is, is gonna be thirty. He's gonna be he thirty was in school yep. for twelve years. <laughs> and if they go right through the fastest, right. they're gonna be thirty. So why all that training? All that training, part of it is so that we can identify what somebody's risk factors are and if we can modify those risk factors to make it a safer anesthetic. So what that entails sometimes is, is if somebody comes in um, and there's something that we see that could be dangerous for them, we might say, let's hold up. We're mm -hmm. going to stop the surgery. Right. We're not doing the surgery today because, because I think you'd be safer if we do these four things and let's do it next month. S patients get mad about that, <laughs> you know, because they well, put their whole life on hold right. to have the surgery. So they're not happy about that. Almost never. I think they're understanding <laughs> eventually that what you're trying to do is keep them safe. Mm -hmm. But I think it's good for them to know that the anesthesiologist is your friend. We're not trying to yeah. be a barrier or stop cases. But we, what we are trying to do is decrease, minimize complications and make sure that you end up alive after the surgery. And so if we think that something should be changed or it could be safer, sa more safely done on a different day, then that's what we would do. As Look, I want you to tell me that every time, doctor. All yeah. right? Every single time. Don't hesitate with me. I'll <laughs> gladly right, push it off good. 30 days down the road. Yeah. Um, now, there is one interesting um, condition that I wanted to ask you about. Um, because I've never, I've never got to ask the question. I just know that it affects a couple of members of my family. And it's a condition that's called malignant hypothermia. Do you, can you explain what that is? Yeah, so what happens with malignant hyperthermia is there's a genetic disorder in some people that certain anesthetics will, will cause their body to kind of go into overdrive in a sense, and it'll just heat up. It'll just get extremely hot. Really? And so this, this disease, which is malignant hyperthermia, is life-threatening for somebody if they, if they get it. Yeah. Now, the benefit of this is it's, it's pretty rare. 
It runs in families. Mm -hmm. And so one question we ask every patient is, has anyone in your family ever had a problem with anesthesia? And we get all kinds of answers like, well, you know, grandpa got a little angry after. And we'll (laughs) listen and say, oh, okay, sounds good. But that's not what we're looking for. What we're really looking for is, did somebody die under anesthesia or is there malignant hyperthermia? in your family. The other one is a pseudoclonesterase deficiency. So there's only a couple things that we're looking for. Is this in your family? Because it's it's genetic. Yeah. And so the benefit of us knowing that is, is if we do know that, there's essentially only two medications that can trigger malignant hyperthermia under anesthesia. One is called succinylcholine, which is a muscle relaxant, and the other is an anesthetic vapor. We have other modalities that work great to keep people asleep. Um, so if we know somebody has malignant hyperthermia, we simply avoid those two medications, and there literally is essentially no risk of them having a problem yeah. with malignant hyperthermia. So, so it's, it's crucial that we know that if it runs in a family, that everyone knows that that's what it is and this is what it's called. I think sometimes it does run in families and occasionally the families, they don't remember or they don't write it down. Sometimes you'll get a story like, well, my mom did say something runs in our family, <laughs> but I don't remember what it's called, you know? And so right. <laughs> it, that's always hard to know what to do. Usually we'll err on the side of safety and yeah. avoid these medications that can trigger my malignant hyperthermia. Oh, that's but yeah, it's a very, very dangerous condition. But what's nice about it is we just avoid two medication classes and, and, There'll be no issue. I've I've heard that the, the, the rooms have to be. I mean, they, they, that has to be. If those have even been in the room, is that true too, or is that more of a? Somebody said that even if those two medications are there, they have to. You know, the room has to be vacant or something for X amount of time, or that yeah. they can be that serious. So I, we, I don't know, but no. So the one medication comes in a syringe that could be. In oh, the room. sure. As long it. as you yep. don't give that to the patient, then right? It's not going to be an <laughs> yeah. issue. The other one though is an anesthetic that probably, if you were to look at general anesthesia, Mm -hmm. probably over 90% of people are kept asleep with an inhaled anesthetic. So most people don't know this, but we give you a medicine through an IV to put you asleep. But then once you're asleep, we usually put a breathing tube in or we put something in your mouth to breathe for you. We vaporize an inhaled anesthetic gas that goes through that. It goes in your lungs, goes directly up to the brain and keeps you asleep. That inhaled (laughs) anesthetic or that vapor, that's what can trigger malignant hyperthermia. So um, back in the day, that when you'd breathe out, you'd breathe some of the vapor out, and it would just go into the OR. Oh, right? I see. Yeah. Nowadays, we have scavenging systems that take that out of the OR. Um, but you don't want that vapor to be in the room. Yep. You know, you don't want any particles to be in the air, and you want to make sure that the anesthesia gas machine has zero of that vapor in it. Oh, that's um, a, God, so that's, so that's the part where you, we do take we. We tape the machine. It's so serious. We tape the machine off. We take everything that could trigger malignant hyperthermia out of the room. <laughs> like we're extremely <laughs> cautious about that when a patient has malignant hyperthermia. Oh my so, God, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what a, I mean, what an what an unbelievable field, really. Going back to the days of ether, I believe is what it was oh, yeah. when they first tried it. Right. Yeah. They would <laughs> just wave some bottle of something under your nose and hope that you were out long enough, or yeah. a shot of whiskey. That the, of course the cliche yeah. that they used to give people. I've heard with anesthesia too that it it can, can it can stop your brain from from making like memories. It can, it can shut because I I've tried to think being at the three or four times I've been under it if I dreamt or remembered anything. Yeah. And, so Boy. there's so there's different levels of anesthesia, you know. When you're I could under, talk when about you're this for like a long time. So. When you're under like a general <laughs> anesthetic, you're not going to remember anything because you're you are completely out. Now we do have medications, um, and probably the most common is one called like midazolam, and that's a benzodiazepine, and that we use it for sedation. So if we're not going to put someone completely out, that one is given to people and kind of relaxing. And one funny story, just to tell you how this works, yes. is my dad. He has atrial fibrillation, and I was with him, and he had to get his heart shocked back into rhythm. Mm-hmm. And now we put people pretty much completely under. But mm-hmm. back then, we, we didn't. We would just give what we call sedation. So they give my dad this medicine, and they're like, are you ready? Ready? They shock him. He's like, oh. <laughs> He's like, well, I don't think I'm going to forget that. <laughs> and I was like, really? Was that bad? He's like, yeah, that was terrible. And then a minute later, he's like, are they going to do it yet? And I was like, what? They just did it. You don't remember? You know, so we don't really use that as much anymore. Oh. But so that that's what we call like sedation or yeah. conscious sedation. So there are medicines that kind of make you forget, but you you weren't necessarily wow. asleep. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's so. it's been fun talking to you, doctor. This is <laughs> like what? this is this is fascinating. Um, it's obviously, I mean, what an incredible tool. 
uh, to make sure that, you know, everybody that needs the care they get can get it as, as pain free as possible. And then afterwards with the pain management that you talked about, I can tell you're passionate about it. I can tell it's something you genuinely care about when it comes to helping these people. And it's just good that we have people like you in the community to do this. So thank you for coming in and talking about it for sure. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate it. Dr. Michael Hewitt, board certified anesthesiologist at Monument Health uh, and the current director, uh, medical director of pain management too there. So thank you, doctor. And anytime you want to come in and just tell stories about anesthesia, we'll do that too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.